Okay, so it's 12 o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Welcome. Um, I want to start off by thanking uh, Ragna for the daughter who uh, invited us to participate um, and she has uh, so gracefully um, coordinated all the events this month for New York Textile Month and also I want to thank of course Lee Edicourt who um, started uh, New York Textile Month five years ago um, and championed all things uh, textile. Um, so we're going to give a brief introduction um, and then we're going to do the screening. It's about six minutes and then Nicole and I are going to have uh, a conversation and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So many of you are probably familiar with the webinar uh, format platform. Um, your cameras are off and you're muted. But if you have any questions for us, please feel free to um, add them into the Q&A. Um, and uh, so I'm Courtney Puckett, and I'm a sculptor, a sculptor of found objects, an assemblage of found objects, and uh, wrap and weave and sew uh, repurposed textiles. Um, the uh, the um, I also have a um, a series of work that's 2D um, repurposed fabric on uh, panels, and uh, that's the series of work that's a part of the collaboration. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, and uh, my collaborative partner is Nicole and Tebby, who's um, smiling with me here. And also, um, our third collaborator is Colin O'Conn, who's out in the webinar crowd, and he'll join us a little bit later. Um, Nicole Antebi is the stop motion animator, um, and Colin O'Conn wrote the uh, six original scores to accompany the six animated textiles that we are screening today. Um, so, Nicole uh, can introduce herself, but I want to. Uh, first, just talk about how the collaborator collaboration was conceived, um, and it's actually quite. Uh, Nicole and I were just talking about this. It's quite funny to see each other on the Zoom screen because she's one of the very few like humans in my world of friends and family that I actually have been seeing in person a lot through this time. Um, we live only about nine minutes away from each other in Holmes, New York, um, which is an hour and a half north of New York City. And um, when we first moved here in 2016, we were um, just acquaintances, but over the last four years, our friendship has become uh, really important, at least I can speak for myself, it's been really important to me, and our friendship has developed through you know a shared experience of having moved from New York City to this kind of rural place um, as you know mutual respect for each other's work um, also uh, shared kind of camaraderie as fellow um, educators in different institutions of higher education and also our shared um, uh, shared commitment to building community. So last year we developed a drawing and animation workshop for kids and adults at a local library. Um, and in through this pandemic we've spent a lot of time uh, taking long walks on uh, different trails around our home. So I have a deep respect for Nicole's work and I became very enamored with uh, these animations that she was putting on Instagram. Um, they're uh, clay animations on top of uh, images that she's found, and I'll, I'll let her talk about it, but images that she's found from the public domain review, specifically textiles, um, old French textiles. Um, and so fast forward to New York Textile Month, um, I thought it would be a great project for us to do together. Um, especially as like in this moment of remoteness, the moving image is so powerful on our screens 
Um, and also a kind of uh, selfish desire to get my own textile work um, in play with her animations. Um, so Nicole, do you want to say a little bit about your work and the collaboration before we screen? Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen because you mentioned the uh, French textile book that I found at the Public Domain Review. Can you see that okay? Yes. All right. I you love see my icky desktop, right? <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction, Courtney, and for, yeah, asking me to, to work on this um, collaboratively. Um, it's been such a joy to work with both you and Colin. And um, yeah, and I can't, I really can't imagine this year without our hikes with Penelope, who's, if you can see, Courtney's adorable uh, little dog, or very big dog, actually, <laughs> but little on screen in the corner there. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's been so important to me. <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, I, uh, I'm a self-taught animator and, um, but I went to, uh, California Institute of the Arts. I'll make this short, <laughs> like I'm not going to give the whole history, but, um, they're known for their animation program, but I didn't study animation there. I was making soft sculptures and I think this is why, um, I mean, I, I think like, that I, since I first started seeing Courtney's work, it really spoke to me. And I think I, I have this um, real connection to textile and, um, and, um, and softness, I guess, in, in, in kind of heavy things. And, um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I studied sculpture, but, um, but I, it never really worked. I, <laughs> I, I kept trying to make sculptures move and nobody told me, you know, you can just be an animator. <laughs> and so I found my way to animation later on, um, but through nonfiction, I was really interested in, in telling these stories that couldn't really be told any other way um, through animation. And, um, and so, um, Let's see, uh, but those projects tended to be really big and uh, unwieldy. And so, um, so I, I was in my research, I came across the Public Domain Review, which is a really interesting um, website um, in the public domain where there's images of alchemy and old texts um, with really interesting, interesting imagery. And, and so um, I did find this book of French te textiles in 18, from 1863. And I was really like interested in how they're arranged on the page and um, started to just like, like come in there and, and try different things out. And I really liked the, the um, the size of a, an animated GIF and and like the potential of making a film that was maybe just a couple frames um, and uh, yeah so and then just uh, really quickly I'll, I'll say that um, I was teaching at the at the I'll say it in English University of the Americas in um, Puebla uh, in Cholula Mexico last year and um, I brought a bunch of clay for my students to do clay animation I had never worked with clay before and and it just sort of like opened up um, a lot of possibilities um, for my work I really like the way clay just responds um, in stop motion um, and so um, then I started working with clay and these um, public domain review projects um, but what, uh, just really quickly, <laughs> there, I think both Courtney and I have sort of like these two paths of, of our work, right? And, and that's kind of what the conversation is, is going to be a little bit about is, you know, these sort of quick projects, um, maybe quicker, I should say, projects uh, in between larger, more maybe research or labor um, induced projects. And um, my other project is about um, growing up on the border and the southern border in El Paso, Texas. I grew up um, a stone's throw from the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, which is the international border. And um, that's a, my, my sort of big uh, research project. And, um, but as a self-taught animator, I, I kind of need to keep teaching myself. And, and these, these sort of smaller projects um, have really like opened up, you know, possibilities for that. So, Thank you so much, Courtney. And thank you, Ragna, so much for, um, for organizing this and, and having us here. I really appreciate it. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the, the reel. Again, it's about six minutes. 
Um, and I just want to preface by saying that, you know, the, the sort of filtering of video and sound through Zoom is not ideal. Um, but uh, so we really want to encourage you guys to check it out on, you know, directly on Vimeo. Um, and uh, Nicole, I think you can share the link in like, I don't know how. <laughs> you go directly to the link, um, which will we'll get to you somehow. Um, <laughs> uh, and maybe we can put it on the New York Textile website. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen.
Hi. Yay. <laughs> so again, um, we will uh, share the link of where you can watch it on uh, Vimeo is where it will be housed. And then I believe this is recorded. So um, watching it through New York Textiles YouTube channel. Um, so we're going to ask each other some questions and then we can open it up to Q and A. Um, and maybe I'll go first. Nicole. So you were talking about, um, how I didn't realize actually, um, that, uh, the using clay as would you say claymation or clay stop motion animation, um, is new. Like you, really just started doing it when you were at the American University in Puebla. Um, and so, and you said you, you do it while you're working on these larger, um, you know, research-based uh, projects that deal with um, border landscape where you're from in El Paso and sister city of Juarez. And I know you, you've been doing a lot of work with uh, the Rio Grande, and um, uh, I'm I'm curious to know, um, like, if you could talk a little bit more about those projects. I mean, they're uh, you know these kinds of consciousness raising research, sort of activist um, projects, but how it relates to like movement and animation and um, so I'm going to share my screen again. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Is it visible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, it's visible, but it's not moving. Oh, there it goes. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, this project has, has, has gone. Uh, thank you for the question, Courtney. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it goes like, kind of far back and, um, I think uh, I think I just wanted to know more about this landscape in which I, I grew up and experienced firsthand, and um, and so I've been researching um, the various international border treaties, going back to the first one, which was 1848, the um, Treaty of um, uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, and this was like the treaty that drew a line down the middle of the river. And um, and then all the subsequent treaties were about like fixing that line um, with border monuments and eventually like fast forward to the wall from 2014 uh, or from sorry from 2000 
six, seven. Uh, so going, you know, like spanning uh, like 150 years of like fortifying the border. And, um, and so uh, I, I, I think I, I'm one person and <laughs> um, I was teaching myself animation and I, and also my questions about this project changed um, for good reason over the last five, six years. And, and so, um, so these like more economical, like animated gifts, just they sort of like serve me in a way, um, cause I'm kind of building this archive of research and animations and thinking of the animations as like sort of transition points. Um, but uh, this uh, image that you're looking at uh, was from a piece I, I wrote last year um, about, um, well, it was, it was about making a meander map for the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo. And uh, I was researching Harold Fisk, um, who made a set of, I think, 22 for the Mississippi. And they're beautiful. And speaking of like textiles, like they feel like textiles, like each one has like a different sort of pattern. And, um, and they're just like incredibly beautiful maps. Um, but maps are, you know, like constructs and, um, and they change. And they're only sort of reflecting maybe, you know, the powers that be at that particular moment. And so um, uh, I wanted I wanted to see one for uh, for this river, and so I I researched the the uh, meandering Rio Grande uh, Rio Bravo when it was meandering um, from these sort of different points, and um, and made up this map. Um, and uh, yeah, I just I wanted to tell the story of you know like what the river wanted to do and um, the way that like fixing the river, uh, reinforcing that border um, was really about um, stopping the flow of people and people who had you know always inhabited this land. Um, so this is like a real deep connection for me um, and. Yeah, so I, this is sort of like one animated GIF in like, <laughs> in an archive of many. And so the idea is to sort of pull them out and write about them or create, um, you know, sort of short uh, form kind of programs around the animations. But I'm always sort of looking for whether it's like in Courtney's work or the textile, you know, piece I showed you, like what, how can I kind of speak to um, the information at hand uh, in, in this sort of existing uh, image or archival document and stuff. Yeah, and that actually relates to another question I wanted to ask you. When we first started talking about doing this collaboration, you shared with me a story about your grandfather who was a um, tailor in New York City. And it seems to me that, and, and he would make clothes for your family made out of the scraps. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, your impulse to um, your impulse towards like pattern and also like repurposing um, existing things um, seems like it's, you know, inherited from your grandfather. Um, yeah, I hadn't. Thank you, Courtney. Like I, until this project actually had made that connection at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's a strange story because yeah, like my family would talk about like these beautiful garments that were seamless. Like he, he just pick up the scraps from like the floor, take them home and then make like my, my mom said, like she'd show him like a magazine cover and then he, like next day she'd have that outfit and stuff. But nobody saved any of these garments, which I also find really curious. You're like, is that apocryphal? Is that like a true story that, that he was making these? But, but yeah, I mean, I think maybe there, there is some, some Something like rooted in that, um, and yeah, I'm, I, 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 I'm like your work is particularly resonant with me um, for that reason, and the same reason I was drawn to like the, the textile book is that there's something in your work. It's not just about like the pattern, but there's always something. There's always surprise in there um, that it, it seems like that's really telling about you know the whole sort of story of the pattern. Mm -hmm. Great. Should I stop the share? Sure. <laughs> so, um, am I, I done have some... <laughs> <laughs> My turn. <laughs> my turn. <laughs> um, let me look at my cheat sheet. Uh, 
<laughs> um, I have a so question actually yeah. from somebody about the sound, which we're going to talk about too. Um, so Courtney, uh, this year I've seen, I feel like a real shift in your work toward movement. And I'm really curious about, um, about like your sculptures, um, and your performance kind of performance work around the sculptures and the way that you're designing them to sort of move, maybe move with you. Maybe it's kind of like a dance partner. Um, and also, yeah, like why maybe you approach me uh, in, in, you know, in terms of like adding this layer of animation to your work. It seems like movement is becoming uh, a little bit more focal um, with the work. And I, I want to know more about what that's about. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I don't think movement was really necessarily, well, it's interesting when I first, you know, I didn't know what you would do with the um, files that I gave you of the um, flat fabric panel work, right? Like I gave, sent you the files and I didn't know what you were gonna do. Um, and seeing how, you know, the animation, seeing the, the movement, um, it, it sort of made me think of like the movement of myself in my body and my arms and my hands and my fingers as I'm constructing the work. Um, so I guess I've always thought of like the relationship between my body and the sculptures that I'm making as really um, integral. But in terms of like actually uh, moving around my pieces myself is something that is is very new. And I think like in this moment, I mean, any anyone who is has like a creative activity that requires, you know, connection to an audience in a physical space is having to kind of rethink how to connect with people if, if, if your work can't be interacted with physically. Um, and so I think, you know, like we're all rethinking that and instead of saying, well, I just like my work can't connect with anybody. It's sort of like, how can you do that? And at the, um, at, it, during the lockdown, I'm actually going to share my screen so I can show you some examples of of what we're talking about. Um, at the beginning of the lockdown, I had a couple of I had work in a couple of different exhibitions, and um, one of them that had the work physically in the gallery and. No one could go into the gallery, but the director did kind of an amazing job of do, taking a lot of video of the exhibition. Is that uh, Marquee Projects in Long Island? Um, and so, so that was sort of a learning thing. And also, uh, another exhibition online that I was in, the work was not at a gallery space, it was in my studio. And I talked to the director, um, it's, it's a gallery called Hesse Flato, and I talked to the, the director about how to present the work in this online format. And we talked about like creating videos that were like, sort of like, he, he said like car commercials, right? So how do you like show the physicality and materiality of the work? So I started making these like car commercials for my sculptures. And then um, just myself entering into it was not something I would have ever um, really done before. It's never, never been a part of what I do. Um, I have no kind of like dance background. I'm actually quite like shy in terms of like dance and, and, and this is like just a little bit of what I would do, but, um, I think it, it really does come out of, uh, a lot of, um, to be honest, like Zoom yoga, like I've just been doing a ton and ton and ton of Zoom, Zoom yoga, but also thinking about Zoom, Zoom yoga and maybe like, like silent films, which is interesting, Nicole, because, and we'll talk about this with the titles of the animations, you, you titled one of them Buster Keaton. Um, and I know you're also doing a lot of like, movement and uh, posting images of yourself um, interacting with the landscape around your house. 
Um, so, so it's like a combination of things that brought me to this idea of movement. Um, uh, but I, I, um, I don't necessarily, I think of the sculptures as quite like static and statuette, like statuary. Um, so I don't necessarily design them to, to move, um, but that might be something I don't know that I'm thinking about for the future, but. Um, you, you have referred to the sculptures as like characters or personages. Um, and um, yeah, I'm wondering <laughs> if you see them, uh-oh, Penelope needs to go out. <laughs> Let that doggy out. <laughs> Or maybe, um, yeah, do you see them? Because I sort of see them as kind of abstractions of political power. Would you, is that, <laughs> based on their titles, I think it's, I think it's their titles, you know, that sort of take me to those places, but. Yeah, so I can talk about that. I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, the sculptures all, have, let's see. Yeah, I do think of the sculptures as characters um, and they're assigned different titles uh, such as uh, the gardener, um, the listener, the overseer, the, the guide, the protector, um, and you know, I, th I think of them as, as kind of, uh, you know, like statues or totems or um, even like sort of like dolls, you know, where we sort of project, um, you know, different kind of, you know, occupational um, or like, uh, I'm distracted by my dog barking. Um, but yeah, so so, so they each kind of, I think of each one as having their own sort of role, right? And, um, you know, whether those roles are um, designated, you know, self-designated or roles that have been designated by, um, you know, society. So it is a way of kind of like working through, you know, um, kind of like, what expectations of gender and age and you know some of them I think of like, as like mother figures and some of them are more paternal some of them are more um like gender neutral um but you know sort of yeah working through my own sort of struggles with power and roles and you know sort of how to you know what how to be in the world right so um this one, for example, is called the editress. And so it can be interpreted a couple different ways, like the editress um, as a kind of older female figure who is like a teacher or, um, you know, imparting wisdom on a younger, um, a younger uh, character. Um, it could also be interpreted as a figure that is looking at herself in the mirror. Um, a friend of mine actually said it looked like a French woman walking her poodle. Um, but yeah, so, um, you know, one of the, the sculptures I'm working on now is called the griever. And so it is like a way of, of, um, you know, sort of empathizing, um, uh, or pl playing tribute. So another, um, sculpture I'm working on now is called the, um, the confidant, and it's. It, I feel like it's a. It's a kind of tribute to a lot of the um, important like friendships with uh, women that have been important in my life, but particularly in this moment. So, um, yeah, they are very representative of of these kinds of um, characters. Um, I feel like. Uh now especially we're we're finding you know the limits of language and what we can you know how it can be 
um, used and how it's sort of failing us in a lot of ways. And, um, and you know, and I look at your work, you know, even though they're, they're abstractions on some level, um, that we're also seeing a lot of things right inside of them and making these really interesting connections through the titles and how they maybe code the, the work and, um, and yeah, that, that really excites me. I don't know, like finding new language, you know, like in our existing sort of like materials and, and recycling old language maybe. Um, but uh, yeah. I am interested in like when you, you handed over the calendar series to me, the titles were, were really, yeah, like ripe. I feel like, you know, that, that took me to places and, and um, so, uh, so when we, we <laughs> what what happened was um, I added the animation and then we retitled them. <laughs> so they were like they were metadata titles. So there was Courtney's original title and date, and then our collaborative title and date. And um, I really liked that that there was like a, a little like um, that they carry sort of like both you know because when you you do something like that's not you know you're handing off a collaboration like it has this sort of other second life and stuff um but will you tell us about your titles a little bit yeah yeah i mean so connecting to back to the sculptures a little bit too is that a lot of times like i have a whole list of um titles for different characters and um that that sort of the those characters that i have in mind um determine you know, what sort of found objects that I find to, to construct them and also like the colors and the shapes. And so I'm really like driven by that, that character first or that idea um, and then gathering the materials to, to build that. Um, and I try to uh, use as much uh, found materials as possible. Um, and then the, the calendar series, which is in this collaboration um, began in 2014 I stopped making them in 2019. I don't know if I might return to them later, but for the moment I'm kind of paused on working with them, but they were a way to kind of um, play with line and shape and pattern on a two dimensional surface without having to deal with all of the challenges of sculpture, of, you know, space and gravity. And, um, and so I created a kind of conceptual framework for them, um, which is that each month, each, each panel represents a different month out of the calendar year. And I have about like three cycles, so like about three for each month. And um, so, so the process is that I would, I would sort of research the month for different, you know, associations of like the, um, you know, historical events or cultural holidays, um, the birthstone of the month, the flower of the month, the agricultural calendar, also, um, the Catholic calendar, which is what I grew up with. Um, and so it's, it's kind of grabbing a bunch of different, like, disparate resources or, or um, references and, and then sort of making these unusual combinations of references. Um, and that's where the titles um, come from, right? So they're kind of like this poetic mishmash connection of, of of these different references and then it's distilled into abstractions um so so yeah that was really fun to see like your ad title add-ons to to it um and uh i want to i want to talk about the music so i it's you know i'm sure it's it's clear now sort of how our process went right like i gave nicole these files of my flat uh, fabric panels and she um, played around, retitled them and played around with the um, clay, uh, stop motion animation. And then um, we asked Colin O'Conn, who actually just texted me and said that he has my dog, which is great um, because he's, uh, full disclosure, Colin O'Conn is, is my husband. So he was also in our sort of pod uh, during the pandemic, um, but we, we invited Colin to, to make some sounds. So um, I'd like to uh, just ask Colin like how he approached it and, and his contribution of sound because the sound is, was really, um, became a really big part of it. Hello. Um, well, as you can see behind me, there's this makeshift music studio on our third floor. 
And the way I approached it was the animations um, had rhythms already there. Um, and as somebody who originated as a drummer and percussionist, that made it pretty easy for me to make scores to the animations. Um, and I did it by, I didn't really pay attention to the titles too much um, because that was kind of steering me in directions. I, I responded to the rhythms because I really wanted to make something that kind of represented it in that way and went with the animation and moved with the animation. And, you know, with the animations making the, the flat work come, in, come alive even more, and then I wanted to add another layer and make it come alive another way. Um, so I would start by, I would just put the animation on loop on my screen and then start improv to the animation and responding to the work and would develop something that way and then start to layer on it um, and overdub onto that. And being someone that's played a lot of improvised music and writing music as well, it's a pretty natural process to me. But it was also super fun and um, freeing too, because I write a lot and it was freeing to improvise, but improvise in a structure um, to something was really, really a kind of a blast for me. Um, so I had, a, I had a great time doing it. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that was my approach. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's 1240. We have about um, like a little less than 15 minutes. Do you want to play the reel again, just in case there are some people who may have joined us later? And then we could ask, uh, you know, any questions, you know, Q&As. Good. I'm not sure how there, it looked like there was one question at the beginning, but I, I don't know how to access the Q&A, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I click on, do you see Q&A at the bottom of your screen? I see it. When I click on it, nothing, like, it's yeah. just blank. It's because I answered oh, them. You answered them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. answered them. But we hope some more questions come in, so uh, I'll go ahead and share the screen and play it again. Uh, Again, um,
Do you want to see about some questions? Um, I was also trying to find a way to put the link in here. Oh, I see somebody asked you about animators. Yeah, Erin, hi. <laughs> Um, well, thanks, Julia. Julia says the combination of animations and videos is really engaging. Um, looks like there's another question there. I'm, I'm just trying to post this. She's wondering what excites you about some of these animators that you're interested in. We have like maybe six minutes. There's another webinar starting at one o'clock. Okay. Uh, well, um, going back to Lottie Reininger, Reininger if, uh, if you're not familiar with her work, she, um, well, there's some question about whether or not she created the very first feature length um, animated film. Um, but um, what I, I think really inspired me about her work was also just that she was able to create um, these like fantastical animations, um, many, many of them in her home <laughs> uh, and didn't rely on a studio. It was all her um, doing stop motion, like completely turned her kitchen table into, you know, a animation workspace. This is like um, 1920s in Weimar, Germany, uh, at a time when there was a paper shortage. <laughs> and um, made these like incredible films and um, so she's like the the godmother of <laughs> animation and um, but yeah on that list I mean each of uh, of those um, they're all women they you know just like I I can I don't know I hear them like some are living some uh, are are long gone but um, but I don't know I, I I think there's there's something about you know being able to do all these things on one's own I think that is is really important and um, yeah yeah it's interesting also um how important it'll be interesting to see how important or not not that it previously wasn't important but a lot m that we'll see a lot more animation now because people aren't I, I don't know because of our uh forced remoteness do you have any thoughts about that yeah, I mean, we were already seeing all, uh, animation in like every sector, especially um, in like the sciences or areas where um, it's uh, the information is maybe hard to access or 
Um, there, you know, as a way to sort of bring kind of like things that like, you know, microscopic cellular level to the forefront to, um, and make them visibly accessible. Right. Um, but you're so right. I mean, I think, yeah, the, a lot of, um, otherwise live action productions that were put on hold are now, you know, like trying to find creative ways of like continuing to make the work, you know, that we've, we've made. And so, yeah, I think animation has a place for sure. It's also just like, it kind of goes without saying, like we all just have like this onslaught of images um, that just seems to increase <laughs> by the day um, <laughs> that, capturing attention um, through movement is just um, seems really powerful right now. Um, I seem to get a lot of response to showing myself in progress making than with just like a still image of a thing, you know, that kind of work in progress and the kind of uh, something happening or something unfolding in front of you. Uh, yeah, it, like I tell my students, like you have more than like a minimum of two frames, you have a story, right? <laughs> like, and um, yeah, there's something about that, right? When you're moving from frame to frame in a sequence, like, yeah, something sort of unfolding, there is something happening, right? And um, so not that there's not in a, a fixed image, but um, it's a little bit more palpable, I think. Mm -hmm. Courtney Tramposh says, uh, they're timely because you can get them out to the masses with no borders. Yeah, I mean, it's like easier than ever, right, to even though it's such a labor intensive, I mean, I think both of our work, is, you know, it's so labor intensive and stuff, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's also more, more doable than ever. <laughs> but you can like, you can figure out a, an animation app on your phone pretty easily, quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, for one, am certainly like addicted to the meditative labor intensive process as just like a way to um, uh, actually um, detach <laughs> from the screen, <laughs> honestly. So anyway, um, I guess we could wrap it up here. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, New York Textile Month. Courtney, thanks, Colin. Thanks, Ragna. Thanks, Bye, everybody. <laughs> thanks everybody for coming and your questions. So nice. Bye.